This is the 966 episode 61. 61. Richard, good morning to you, sir. How are you? How are you, Mr. Lucian? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. In one piece over here. We've got a really good episode today, Richard. We'll be talking with Dr. Abdelaziz Alanazi, a very dear and old friend to us, assistant professor at King Saud University in Riyadh, PhD in environmental engineering, who just recently won a very prestigious international award, which we'll get to in a moment. But before we get started, there's a lot to get to this week, Richard. Please subscribe to us wherever you're getting us. Uh, YouTube, if you're on our YouTube fam, what's up? Um, Spotify, (laughs) uh, let's see, Apple Podcasts, 29. We haven't added any new platforms this week. It seems like it goes up each week, Richard, but 29 platforms you can find us on. So subscribe to us wherever you're getting us. 29, yep. <laughs> 29 uh, I think well, I don't know if we're a juggernaut, but I mean, we just keep growing and growing and keep getting more and more listeners and viewers. It's just so it's I, I'm I'm humbled, I guess is the proper term. It's just pretty amazing. It is amazing. And Richard, as you know, and we've talked about both on the air and off the air, it's hard to know what to expect once you start something like this. Yeah. So I didn't it's, it's sort I, of my all expectations good, yeah. were really low. What were yours? Mine too. Yeah. I was like, well, let's just record. Let's just yeah, talk you know, and record it. <laughs> you know, I know, you know, I was confident my mom would listen. I mean, <laughs> and she's still a listener too. We haven't lost her, I don't think, right? She's, she's, yes, she's an avid Hello, listener. Mrs. Wilson. <laughs> Hi, Mom. But I mean, so many more. I mean, we're like, you know, our projections are, are you know, we've talked about it, hopefully close to 10,000 plus subscribers by the end of the year on all platforms, and, and it, which is just stunning to me. So I, I, I'm like I said, it's humbling and it's quite neat. Needs it, needs not needs not a very good term, but actually it's quite neat. No, neat is a good term. Um, it's interesting too. We get the audience breakdown, and it doesn't apply to all of our platforms, really, just the audio. But it's like something like forty five percent of our users or listeners are in the U.S., and then another thirty five are in Saudi Arabia, and then there's a bunch of different listeners around the world, which is cool. Fifty countries, as we've discussed before, so. Hello to the other 48 countries outside of Saudi Arabia here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, States. didn't you say it went up to 52? So hello it's to the 52, other 50. yeah, 52, yeah. I don't know what those two countries are, though. It just said 52 <laughs> countries. So could be anywhere. Um, Richard, let's get started. What's your one big thing this week? Um, I was tempted uh, to do another book report. As you know, I have a f- sort of flaw that way. Uh, the Saudi Ministry of Finance uh, recently released its 2023 pre-budget report. And it's 38 pages of, quote, key fiscal targets and economic indicators, unquote. I could barely, you know, keep myself from that. Uh, And it's an example of good governments. But as exciting as that sounds, I'm heading in another direction. Instead, I want to I want to pull the strings a little bit on on this recent announcement, which is actually also a good example of, of governance, good governance. So the announcement is the Saudi Ministry of Commerce announces 10 initiatives to develop e-commerce stores and improve consumer service quality. So there's 10 of these initiatives. They include e-commerce retailers are required to include all warranty information. You know, uh, they're required to diversify shipping and delivery alternatives. They're required to um, offer a variety of payment options, um, you know, and required to include an Arabic video explaining the product. So anyway, um, the Ministry of Commerce reiterated that it is collaborating with e-stores to undertake these initiatives to improve the services provided by the sector. So this is all well and good. Um, It's clear the Ministry of Commerce is trying to promote a more uniformly positive e-commerce retail experience for Saudis. But that is not the most interesting point part to me. Um, The interesting part to me is how did the ministry decide on these 10 initiatives? And as it turns out, these 10 initiatives were based on a Ministry of Commerce survey that had more than 6,000 responses detailing challenges faced by e-commerce retail customers. So in short, before the ministry introduced any regulations on the matter, they asked for input from con- consumers. And and the reason I want to you know draw this out a little bit is because this is a theme not only with the Ministry of Commerce, but with many Saudi ministries. And a primary vehicle for these surveys uh, has been the National Competitiveness Center, the NCC, um, also called TASIR. So 
The NCC was established in 2019, and it's an independent government center. It's actually under the aegis of the Council of Economic and Development Affairs, CETA, which is, as we know, is a paramount so commercial and economic body in, in Saudi Arabia. Um, its chairman is uh, Dr. Majid al Kasabi. He's actually Dr. Majid al Kasabi, Minister of Commerce and Acting Minister of Media. The CEO of NCC is Dr. Yaman al Muteri, who is also the Deputy Minister of Commerce. So, among other things, the NCC seeks to, quote, improve the kingdom's ranking in relevant global indicators and reports by studying, identifying, and analyzing the obstacles and challenges facing the public and private sectors, proposing solutions, initiatives, and recommendations, unquote. One of the ways the NCC works to achieve this goal is, is to solicit customer and consumer feedback through two platforms. One is a private sector feedback platform, and the other is a public consultation platform. So, for example, the Ministry of Commerce has used the NCC to implement at least 16 surveys, some of which are still ongoing. It's kind of interesting to look at the portal. You can see how many days are left in order to you know, uh, offer your feedback or suggestions. So at least 16 surveys in which the public can weigh in with comments and suggestions on subjects ranging from consumer protection law, arbitration law, debt collection, and so on. Uh, but the Ministry of Commerce is, is far from the only agency to utilize the NCC platform to date. And this is, the NCC was established in 2019. The NCC has conducted surveys for a variety of agencies, including 148 in the health sector, 93 in trade economy and investment, nine education and science sector, 22 judicial and human rights sector, 24 labor and social welfare sector, welfare sector. So to return to the beginning of this one big thing, um, this issuance by the Ministry of Commerce of e-commerce retail guidelines wasn't just a matter of sort of bureaucrats getting together and making rules, which is often the case. It was a result of seeking input from actual customers and consumers. And, and this process is being played out, as noted, across multiple sectors by multiple ministries and agencies. So th this is good governance. Um, and obviously, good governance is perhaps probably the key element of public satisfaction with the government. And uh, Saudi, like every country, doesn't always get its rules and regulations right. But this widespread effort by ministries to actually ask the regulated how and what they would like to see regulated is is noteworthy. And I think it's very promising. As I, as I mentioned back to the beginning, it's, it's an example of, of good governance. Very interesting. Very good one, Richard. I mean, if you think about the disconnect now in the United States between governance and the people, and there just increasingly seems to be a huge change or a huge like gap growing between what people want and how the government works here. And, you know, obviously we're a democracy with checks and balances. Um, we have a president, we have Congress and we have a judiciary and they all have different powers. They're all trying to work together. And like they say about democracy, it's it's the worst system ever, except for all the other ones. Um, <laughs> but the idea is that it's sort of slow and that it, it you know, it ends up in the right direction, ends up going in the right place. This is a very different style of that, but with a similar result. It's, it's you know, putting its hands, e-governance, it's like really having your hand as a, govern, as, a, as a leader on what the people want and then creating policy, like you just said, based on what the market wants, what buyers and sellers want, what they think and feel. Part of the reason why you do this is that, so you don't have to every six months completely change and adapt after you've already initiated um, uh, you know, promulgated regulations. You're, you're essentially saying, hey, this is what we think everybody wants to do. What do you guys think? Okay, let's get the feedback. All right, so this is what the rules are now. We have 10 of them, or uh, I think you said 10. Yeah. Um, and and so like, let's, let's do this and see how it goes. I mean, part of uh, the hallmark of Vision 2030 is the ability to change what you're doing as a, as a leader in the government space if it's not working or if a KPI is missed, well, you try and maybe adjust it or, hey, we're not going to do this anymore. We're going to do this. Like the adaptability of Vision 2030 with with governance in Saudi Arabia is one of the, sh you know, strongest things you can see that's different than it was before 2016 when it was announced. Uh, you, there's a lot of big, uh, some big ideas in, in that 
comment, and I agree. I mean, it, with regard to the U.S., we're speaking of governments, and you know, in my opinion, you know, one of our biggest issues is sort of complete collapse in terms of uh, effectiveness of the legislative branch, specifically Congress. Yep. But that's a whole different question. Mm -hmm. um, speaking directly to two two of your points, one being part of the compact of the of Vision Twenty Thirty. You know, when you're talking about VAT and reducing subsidies and increasing prices, as part of that compact is from the government side, they will provide better governance. And uh, so much of what's being done is trying to provide that, you know, this feedback. And the other thing is, I think it's been surprising and encouraging. And actually, Dr. Majid al Kasabi, who's mentioned in this one big thing, and I think we both agree is 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 a superb government official at in any place at any time. He's incredible. He's yeah. just a really really capable person. Um, when he visited here, Washington, he spoke at CSIS um, in 2017, and he specifically said, he said, "Look, this is our vision. This is our plan. But it's two steps up, one step back. We're gonna get things wrong." And we're going to have to adjust. It's not a straight line. These aren't his exact words, but his point was exactly that: that we will we will move forward, we'll assess the situation, we'll make adjustments, we'll move forward again. And uh, this interaction that you're seeing, you know, the National Competitive Center, the Competitiveness Center, and these surveys, an example. These interactions between you know the governed and the uh, the, the government and the governed. Um, reflects that commitment to better governments, reflects that commitment to, all right, this is, let's understand what we're trying to regulate better. So, um, so we can regulate that. And, and this is, it, a, it shows. Oh, sorry. Yep. I know it shows. And this is an interesting space where you're seeing this type of, you know, uh, adaptable governance and this sort of responsive governance, um, e-commerce and, you know, it's, it's, it's still sort of new in Saudi Arabia. I was reading a little bit um, about the USTR. The USTR had some information about this recently. By 2024, the number of Saudi internet users for e-commerce selling and buying is expected to reach 33.6 million. That's an increase of 42% from 2019. I don't have the stats for the US, but the US is a little bit ahead of Saudi Arabia on e-commerce, but Saudis like to shop. I mean, there's still, the coolest places to go in Riyadh right now are the, the new malls that are being built, which is just really impressive. And there's so much to do there. And it's more of a social thing. So people in Saudi Arabia like to shop in person a lot still. So this is something that Saudi Arabia wants to get right. They don't want to have, you know, because e-commerce is huge and it's it can add a lot to the GDP and has enormous potential. But you want to get it right. You don't want to have some rules go out there and have people be like, well, this this is not this has not helped me want to buy stuff online and sell stuff online. So yeah, it's, <clears> this is really, this is really a good one, Richard. I mean, again, this is what we do at the 966 is, you know, there's oil prices dominating the headlines. There's all the <laughs> other things going on. And it's like, this is, this is something that's going to be meaningful for the next five years. And it is isn't dominating headlines that we're giving attention to right now. And it's a habit that's encouraging in terms of by the government. And let's, let's cross market here because you mentioned the e-commerce. E in our Sustig Review, our daily newsletter, the most widely read newsletter on Saudi Arabia in the world, mm -hmm. um, there's an excellent, and we feature it, it's one of the uh, top top four uh, feature article by checkout.com on the e-commerce market in Saudi Arabia. And it, it you know, it's it's really interesting. And let me just quote quickly from that. According to the report, this is checkout.com's third annual report on digital transformation. 91% of Saudi consumers now shop e-commerce. Perhaps even more striking is that a staggering 14% of them say they shop online at least once per day. Um, the future looks even brighter with 78% of consumers in Saudi saying they will maintain or increase their current level e-commerce e spending into 2023. So, so um, there you have it. Uh, you know, and this is why Ministry of Commerce sees fit to go out and ask consumers what they think of the e-commerce environment and in turn respond with specific guidelines for e-commerce vendors and retailers on how they can better serve the market. Mm -hmm. It's a virtuous cycle and it's it's the result of a commitment to better governance. Um, <laughs> okay, so Richard, just like you, I sort of was in between two one big things this week. 
Um, and I'm really sorry because I emailed you twice li- late last night, changing my <laughs> mind back and forth, giving you no time to prepare. And that's OK. We're just going to do it on the fly. But um, before we get to my real one big thing, I sort of a pseudo one big thing. I just returned from Riyadh, Richard. Um, just want to really briefly mention great visit there. It's really an interesting time in the Saudi capital. We hear it a lot, how much it's changing and evolving and growing. We see it from where we're sitting here in the States. We follow the news all day, but it's just sort of interesting because like when you, when you're there, it's, it's like just from the start, like flying in over the city, you can see it's bigger. You can see whole new neighborhoods and areas being developed or already developed. You can see the Metro is almost done, which blew my mind. Um, It's been since right before the pandemic that we went, Richard, and you know, the Metro is now connected to the airport and it goes all over the city. And it's, I mean, it's really incredible. Um, Restaurants, fine dining, there's a totally new vibe to Riyadh right now. And it seems like everybody says, well, don't you know that Riyadh is changing? Can't you feel it changing? And it's, it's really, I mean, it really is amazing. It's, it's cool. And then there are some things, Richard, which are exactly the same. Um, Number one, the amount of coffee that I drank was possibly very unhealthy for me and maybe detrimental by long-term health, but that's okay. Um, Saudi hospitality is just unbelievable. Maybe the most hospitable people in the world. Friends are welcoming. And if you try to pick up a check when you're at the dinner, they will threaten you with violence, which is amazing. Um, got to visit with several of our previous 966 guests, Richard, which was great. Um, so I just wanted to give a, give a shout out to everybody that I saw in Riyadh. Got a lot of people that said, hey, I, I've heard the podcast before, people I haven't met, which was cool. Yeah, um, uh, so yeah, it just gets up Richard. All right. So no, no, it's interesting on that. <clears throat> we're coming to a time now, whereas, as it's easier to get into Saudi Arabia, there's more reasons to go. There's a sort of a, a vibe and a, and an excitement about doing this is there'll be increasing numbers who have no idea what their before was, mm-hmm. you know, Good there's point. for us who have a, have a, a, a long arc in terms of our relationship with Saudi Arabia and having visited for many, many, many years, decades, even there's a before and now there's increasingly an after, but you know, within a fairly short time span, the absolute number of people who have been to Saudi Arabia will be greater on the after time, you know, Mm -hmm. so they don't know, they won't know of a before. Right. So, you know, when they go to Saudi Arabia, they'll go, Oh, this is how it is. And, and, and I guess in many ways, that's a good thing. And, 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 you know, if you're Saudi Arabia, that's exactly, you know, let's, let's, let's turn a page on terms of your interaction and your expectations about Saudi Arabia. But it is interesting to think that, you know, we, you know, the population of people who know the before are quickly going to be outnumbered by the people who only know the after. So I wanted to make that a little mini one big thing. (laughs) And by by real (laughs) one big thing this week is... Let's do a little bit of an update on Live Golf. Richard, as you know, we broke a very important streak with episode 60 last last week. It was a very sad moment. We did not mention the word golf. So our episode counter, which is like one of those accident counters you'd see at a construction site, gets reset to one. We've got a streak of one episode now in a row where we've (laughs) mentioned Live Golf. Um, Let's reset it properly by talking a little bit about what's going on with Live Golf and sort of the latest there. Uh, first, a little positive movement for Liv as it, on its quest to get world golf ranking points. Because Liv is a startup circuit, players do not receive um, OWGR, official world golf ranking points. So players that have joined Liv uh, in its first five events have a much reduced chance of qualifying for majors without previously earned exemption. So if you joined Liv, you're not getting these points, which you can use to play in the British Open or the Masters. Um And so even if you have a very strong negative opinion about live golf, you probably have to objectively say that this is not really fair. I mean, 12 of the top 50 players in the world are playing with live golf now. So even if you don't like it, it's sort of detrimental to these majors and the watchability of those majors. If you're just not including Cameron Smith, the number three player in the world, Dustin Johnson, and so on. CEO and commissioner of live golf, Greg Norman, the shark has become increasingly frustrated with this. He wrote in a letter to live golfers on August 17th, uh, about two months ago, that the circuit quote, by any fair objective and impartial review should be awarded world ranking points for its events in the very near future, which has not happened yet. Um, Looks like they're getting a little traction though, a little creativity and diligence from Norman. Live golfers may soon get these points thanks to a strategic alliance with the little known MENA tour. MENA, Middle East North Africa Tour, which is a feeder circuit, but is recognized by the OWGR. 
It's not a done deal yet, according to Golf Digest about 90 minutes ago, Richard. Um, the OWGR, quote, acknowledged receipt of communication from MENA outlining changes to its membership structure and said it will begin the review process on its changes. But the ranking organization said that Live is still not eligible for points this week or next week at its next event in Jeddah. Um, Richard, I guess my point here, there's kind of get a little bit of update on Live, but this is kind of Live Golf's time to shine. PGA is finished. Their season is over. Live Golf keeps going on. It's going to be in what the philippines this weekend uh, uh, i thought it was bangkok but bangkok maybe, okay sorry yeah. it's going to be in bangkok this weekend and then goes to Jeddah next so even if they don't get those points if you're a fan of golf this is exactly why live golf can add value because it's going there's going to be golf on tv or maybe not tv yet youtube tv but there's going to be golf for you to watch and follow in the off season instead of having three or four months here where nothing happens um, it's also a really good chance for Lib to expand the game to these new destinations. Obviously, Saudi Arabia, they're just sort of building interest in the game. Um, Bangkok. Lib is a global tour, whereas the PGA is mostly played in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. So there is that value add there. Um, golf is something I think maybe some don't want us to talk about all the time on this podcast, which I understand. We talk about it, Richard, because we don't get to play it very much. So it's a nice <laughs> little outlet for us. But um yeah, just a little update on what's going on with Liv. Well, it gets a lot of news. Um, yep. So it's, it is, you know, it's definitely worthy of, of conversation. Um, this um, official world golf ranking is a big thing. And, and you know, th- this is because three of the four men's majors use that wor- world ranking as a criteria for entry into their fields. Um, Masters takes the top 50, U.S. Open takes the top 60, uh, Open Championships top 50, PGA has a little different formula. Um, and it's, it's, it's disconcerting if you've gone to the live t- tour for whatever reasons to see that. So, for example, just since June, in terms of that OWGR ranking, a guy like Phil Mickelson, Mickelson has dropped 62 points, 62 levels. You know, Ian Poulter, 37, Sergio Garcia, 24, even Dustin Johnson, you know, eight, Brooks Kepka, 12, you know, so, so it's, it's a significant um, concern and possible detriment if you're thinking about the live tournament. So I can understand why the PGA doesn't want any part of this, you know, because it's, you know, they can hang that over the head of someone who's thinking of, of, and I hate the term defecting. I think it's a, that's one of those, those sneaky terms. Cause that's what everyone uses, you know, X, X, X player defects to live, you know, BS, you know, it, they've chosen to go there uh, to play their sport. So, you know, it's a, it's a matter of choice. And you said 12 of the top 50, they have 26 of the top 100. So it's a real deal. And this has happened in roughly a year. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is a Titanic struggle, really Titanic because Liv clearly identified some deficiencies in, in the PGA's approach, you know, by offering higher purses, smaller fields, and so on. No cut, you know. And the PGA, to its credit, I guess, has responded, you know, really aggressively. It's upped its purses. It has all these boutique now. Has increased, you know, it changed its calendar. It has boutique tournaments now. Um, so this is, you know, this is... And there's obviously there's also a lawsuit right now. There's a significant lawsuit that Liv brought against the PGA, uh, and is you know has I think initially had ten uh, golfers who were uh, part of it. Now it's down to three. If this happens, you know if that official world golf ranking is available through the MENA tour to live go- uh, live tour members. It, it will eliminate, I think, in some ways that golf, you know, that that uh, dispute, that legal dispute. Um, obviously, it won't eliminate the tension and the conflict and the arguments. But I would think if I'm from the PGA perspective, if a player can go to live and still earn OWGR points, that's going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell, you, I, I'll tell you why, just for the simple economics of it. This little breakdown of uh, winnings per hole. 
So the Live Golf Tournament in London that Charles Schwartzel won in June, his winnings per hole were just under $75,000. Scotty Scheffler, who won the Masters, his winnings per hole were thirty seven five. More important, the sort of local turn, not not you know, not non major RBC, for example, Royal Bank of Canada, Canada, Canada <clears throat> Canadian Open, won by Roy and McElroy, twenty one thousand six hundred per hole. Just as a point of comparison, just this year, twenty twenty two earnings rankings, Dustin Johnson has individual earnings are nine million seven hundred fifty thousand dollars his team earnings as we know we've talked about this every tournament has a team contact which is kind of neat three million dollars so that's five tournaments he's made over 12 million dollars and this has nothing to do with how much he was paid just to come over to the tour but you know so but you know let's take dustin johnson aside um sam horsefield you know, you know who Sam Horsfield is? I do, but I'm you kind do? of a nerd. Yes, I do. You do know Sam? I do. All right, let yeah. me find another one. We have a we have a lot of uh, we keep golf on the background on the TV oh, here. My That's like a nice you know thing. Sam so. Horsfield. All right, how about Peter Uline? <laughs> Peter Uline, I don't know. There you go. <laughs> He's made four and a half million dollars on the Live Tour. How about how about Anur Ben Lahiri? No. He's made uh, over two million dollars. This is five tournaments, you know. So uh, how about how about uh, Jason Cockrack? Oh, Jason Cockrack, I know. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, he's, he's big. A big. He's, an he's a big hitter. Yeah. <laughs> he's an amateur. Yeah, that's a big can. That was a big get. But anyway, how about uh, Flashera Conguantami? You got me there. <laughs> over a million dollars in five tournaments. Anyway, you you see where we're going with this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So anyway, this Mina, this Mina tour uh, link up would be, would be both would be consequential and might also, you know, deconflict in terms of the suit right now. I got to think it'd be make live even more attractive, but speaking of changes, one of the problems with, with OWGR points is, you know, they're based on how many players in the field, the rankings of the players in the field, if you make the cut and your final finish. And so it's difficult with the 54 hole format with no cut. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. I mean, so live may actually make some adjustments in order to, to qualify and fit closer to the, to the, you know, OWGR requirements. But in any case, it's, as I said earlier, it's a Titanic struggle and it's really interesting to see the two parties go back and forth. Yeah. I mean, if you're live and you're, you're organizing these tournaments and you're sort of the brains behind it, you're thinking, well, look, like we're going to try a bunch of new stuff and we're sure not all of it's going to work out, but you know, there's a chance that we just, one of these things was really cool and people really liked it and it became our signature thing of live. And that, you know, there isn't one of those things yet right now it's just money. But if you think about it and you're a player, like you just said, and you noted a bunch of players, none of us have ever heard of that are now getting big paydays on live. And it's like, you know, golfers, uh, especially professional golfers, there is no guarantee. It's already a sport with a tremendous sport with a tremendous amount of luck. I mean, you know, rim outs of putts and bad lies, and you know, you can go on and on with this. But you know, to be a really successful golfer on the PGA Tour, you got to have some luck, and you'd rather be lucky than good. Um, and in golf, um, you know, if you get injured or you throw out your back or something happens, you're not guaranteed a payday in the same way like you are in major team sports in the United States. You know, you go down with a, a knee injury in football, you get your salary for the rest of the year. Somebody else might take your spot. That might be the beginning of the end of your career. You may get traded, but like you're guaranteed what you're guaranteed pretty much as long as, you know, you're on the team and you try to get better with golfers. You know, you break a wrist, you fall down, you get in a car accident. You don't know where your next paycheck is going to come from. So for golfers, for the players themselves, I mean, there's no, it's not just big paydays, it's guaranteed paydays. And those are very attractive when the future is uncertain for all of us. So there's, so there's that. But um, Richard, I thought that was really, really interesting though, because it's like what you were talking about really kind of made it clear. It's like, they're just trying to find a way to fit into the whole conversation about like, what is golf and where these points go. And Obviously, if you're the PGA Tour, you've mishandled this really from the beginning. But now you're dealing with, well, if these golfers get these points, then Liv is here to stay. And it's really official because they will be they will be playing in all of these major events except for the PGA. 
So, I mean, Liv is in a good spot right now, definitely. Well, I think that, that as we've said a couple of times, you know, I, I, I'm just glad to see it going on. And, and we're past the sort of Phil Mickelson tobacco at the beginning. And, and you know, remember in the onset, it was all talk and conjecture. And, and now it's real and you can deal with it and people can adjust. From my perspective, none of these guys are particularly attractive. I mean, if you're, I, 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 I have sympathy for guys on, you know, struggling on a Nike tour to trying to make it to the, or a qualifying tour trying to make it. But if you're on the circuit and you're playing golf and you're making, you know, you're saying you're a top 100 guy and you're making on the PGA through endorsements and prize winnings, you know, upwards of a million dollars at the, at the bottom, uh, and you know you, the hardship is to practice hard and, and work at your craft and, and and play maybe 22 golf tournaments a year. I, I understand the, the stress and and that sort of thing, uh, but, but I don't think any of these guys are sympathetic characters. I do think they have the right to go play at live if they want to, and I do think it's telling. We've talked about BGA's reaction essentially confirmed and affirmed everything that live was pointing out was that you're not, you know, you're lefting, you're leaving a lot on the table in terms of your talent. You know, you're not paying them enough. Your fields are too big. The calendar is wonky. Um, and it's clear that the PGA was, as we've talked about, and if you're, if you're a long time PGA player and all of a sudden you see all this money, you're going, well, where was that? I mean, you know, clearly Liv was right. You were withholding. Um, so anyway, uh, but you know, back to the beginning, I, I, I don't know, I don't know necessarily know that it's sympathetic. I think it's a fascinating story. I think it's a big play. I think it's really interesting from Saudi Arabia's perspective because they get a lot of negative press about this, mm -hmm. but they forge ahead. And I also think it's interesting. Uh, there was a recent article in the athletic on it's the first part of a part three series on the Newcastle acquisition, Newcastle, uh, football club. And it talks about how extraordinarily well run it's, it has been. And, you know, that, you know, all these concerns about, you know, the Saudis coming in and doing this and that, and then, you know, that, you know, when you dig down into it has been really well run and, um, and a little significantly more below the radar than the live experience. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have two different sorts of approaches, but anyway, I think it's all fascinating and, and I think it's newsworthy. Big, great point. Big winner in all this is Golf Digest, Golf.com, all yeah. these golf publications, all the Instagram accounts that are just ginning up. And of course, 966 debate. listeners. Oh, the 966 listeners are the biggest winners of them all <laughs> because they get to listen to us every week and talk about golf, um, which is funny. Just last little thing to add to this. I got a lot of people... Um, when I was in Riyadh last week, sort of saying, oh, like, you know, you've heard about Live Golf, you know, because they're sick of it. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're not golf fans yet. All they yeah. know is they're getting a lot of heat from all sides on this. Yeah. Um, and it's just kind of funny because I'm like, yeah, I am. Um, but so anyway, um, interesting stuff. If you are listening to this as a podcast or you're watching the full episode on YouTube, just a quick reminder before we get to our conversation with Dr. Abdulaziz al -Nazi, you can watch any of these things as segments. So if you don't want to listen to the live golf conversation, which as some people we, and we hear from these people <laughs> very frequently, stop talking about golf, please. Um, we will put, and we always do put little timestamps in the show notes and those become hyperlinks. So if you're going to skip live golf, or you want to come back and listen to this segment a second time, it's that exciting to you can click <laughs> that link and it just plays right from there. So it should be easy for you to find. And again, obviously all this stuff's chopped up and put onto YouTube as well. So um, yeah, yeah. We get a lot of people that only listen to our talks on live golf and move on. And that's okay. We're not picky about who listens to this podcast. So Richard, what do you think? Let's get to our conversation with Dr. Abilities Alanasi. Joining us on the 966, a very special guest, longtime friend Richard, and truly one of my dearest friends as well, Dr. Abdulaziz Alanazi, who is joining us from Riyadh. He is an assistant professor at King Saud University in Riyadh with a PhD in environmental engineering. And recently, Dr. Abdulaziz, along with his colleagues at the University of Cincinnati, won a very prestigious international award for their work studying ways to address water pollution. The Prince Sultan bin Abdelaziz International Prize for Water was awarded to Dr. Abdelaziz and his colleagues for their work developing advanced oxidation techniques and nanotechnologies to monitor and treat emerging toxins and other contaminants of emerging concern in water. 
So cool. Dr. Abdelaziz, we're so excited to speak with you today. Thank, Thank you so much you for so joining much. us on the 966. I really appreciate you guys having me here, Richard and Lucian, my uh, oldest friends and <laughs> colleagues back when I started my mm -hmm. uh, PhD in 2012. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I was, we were talking prior and I was saying, I feel like we're, Lucian, you and I are on team Aziz in terms of all of this. Because 100%. Way, back, way before, even before you had kids. Yes. Um, yes. And it's such a treat. Uh, it, but, it, but two things. One, you know, obviously you're Aziz to us, but, you know, it's got to be Dr. Abdulaziz Owen Nazi here. Doctor, this, yeah. This is yeah, you can call me, I prefer Aziz. And oh, I know, I know. We'll, <laughs> but, I mean, we, we need to give proper respect. And and I, I think Thank this you. is, this this award is, it really is prestigious. And I want to make a point because Lucian, Lucian did, you know, reference this, but the, this Prince Sultan bin Abdulaziz International Prize for Water. It's this is the tenth year. It, it was uh, in, launched in two thousand two, but I think it's important to note uh, there's four specialized prizes. You yes. know, one for surface water, one for groundwater, one for alternative water, one for water management and protection, and then there's one prestigious, doubly prestigious prize called the Creativity Prize. Yes. And your team won the Creativity Prize. Yes, uh, the team, uh, our team, and uh, led by uh, I call him great Dr. Uh, Dion in the University of Cincinnati. Uh, we were uh, so uh, so happy to, uh, and we actually just one more correct, uh, like a little bit correction, uh, Richard. It's twenty years ago, but you can apply for only two years, so it's by annual. And uh, every two years, you will be able to uh, submit for the prize. And for the Creativity Prize, actually, you cannot just submit by yourself. You have to be nominated by a well-known research or university organization. So uh, I remember Dr. Dion, I first started my PhD with him. Uh, he insisted on focusing and actually uh, on novelty. And he always tried to be fundamental and novel. So when I picked that up at early young age, and uh, that passion I had uh, about, uh, again, everything different, being different, being passionate about what I do, uh, made a huge uh, impact right, right now in my life. So uh, it's uh, very different to have the creativity prize than the other prizes. Uh, it's bigger in financial uh, reward, and it's uh, uh, it's supportive and makes you keep going, thinking the same way, and uh, achieve uh, further uh, and higher. Uh, I mean, uh, achieves and maybe we need to revise this a little bit. So it makes you uh, achieve higher level in future life, especially in the beginning of my career. It's very important for me to be a part of this prize. Can you talk a little bit about the work, you, you know, the work that you did at the University of Cincinnati? And by the way, usually Lucian is the one who does a really good job with names. And um, and your professor, they had, they had that program yeah. and your team leader. Uh, do you, I, I think he should get a proper, you know, you know, shout out on the on the yes. 966 properly yes. pronounced. How do we pronounce his name? Uh, we say Dionysio, Dionysio. Uh, uh if I said it correctly, uh, uh, it's okay. If I didn't, uh, I apologize to Dr. Dion myself. <laughs> well, we call him Dr. Dion. He signs him, his name as Dr. Dion. Uh, he's an editor in so many uh, high prestigious journals. And uh, I was uh, happy uh, and challenged uh, at the same time for many, many years uh, when we were doing work at the University of Cincinnati. Can you, can you, for the layman, for us yeah. who don't really know, can okay. you t tell us a little bit about your work and, and, and the applications it has? Yeah, so mainly uh, we started focusing on water. You know, uh, I'm sure water is fundamental. Water is life and mat mat water is fundamental. Water is life's matter and matrix. So we were focusing on uh, removing uh, and before removing, detecting emerging contaminants on water. So uh, we started by pharmaceuticals, uh, and actually before pharmaceuticals, Dr. Dion was focusing on cyanobacteria. You know, Great Lakes have a big issue with it. And then we developed uh, techniques and sensors to detect 
and re- degrade actually these emerging contaminants. You know, the industrial revolution uh, for the last 30, 40 years has been going so fast. Uh, human uh, got the habit of just uh, uh, regenerating, generating, making more, making more, making more cars, making more food, making more plastic, making more clothes. And that led to making more contaminants at the same time. We didn't care for our environment for the last 30 or 40 years uh, as we cared for producing more and uh, not just uh, holding some uh, responsible uh, sectors or people accountable. So uh, we focused on uh, these emerging contaminants. They come out from EPA every once in a while, US EPA. Uh, they call them CCL1, CCL2, CCL1 uh, contaminants candidates list. And these contaminants, usually uh, there is no means of uh, detecting them. You cannot measure them, you cannot quantify them. So we were focusing on detection, uh, quantification, and uh, then finding a, a proper way to degrade them without even harming the contaminants. So uh, we uh, were working so hard in the lab. Uh, Dr. Dion was working so hard uh, in, on the computer and uh, providing you know, what's needed for uh, sustainable research. Uh, we started by many, I can keep going and talking a lot, but uh, we were just forced, like working so hard to do the right uh, uh, degradation mechanism and publish the right uh, paper. Well, you, you know, in the, in that article and that talks a lot about this award and, and the team and all the things you were working on, it did go into some depth, you know, the blue green algae, the, I was fascinated. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize things like sunscreen end up creating contaminants. You know? Yes. Uh, and, and there's a whole, oh, I guess there's a whole, you know, yeah. subset of, of things that we don't think is causing long lasting contaminants that do, you know, cookware and flame retardant yes. fabrics, all these things. So does your work help detect these things? Uh, so uh, part of the group was focusing on detection and still focusing on detection mechanism. So we create the, these sensors. Uh, the other part of the group, which I was part uh, of focusing on synthesis of, uh, and they call it magnetic nanoparticle, and we'll go back to that in a little bit, uh, to degrade these contaminants, like back to sunscreen. Sunscreen, they have what, what's in them called UV blocker. Right. So to block the UV uh, coming on in the sunlight and then on the skin. When the UV hits the sunscreen, it gets activated. And once it's activated, it becomes very water-soluble. So there's PPSA, there's many contaminants, and many, not contaminants, many UV protectors uh, in, in the sunscreen. And once we take a shower or go to the swimming pool or do whatever we do in our daily life, they are very water soluble, and then they end up in our drinking system. Research showed that uh, sunscreen has been detected widely in our aquatic system of influent and the effluent of uh, water treatment plants in higher concentrations. Uh, so uh, that proved that all these conventional water treatment uh, plants they are not necessarily removing these contaminants uh, from water and either discharging them to the river and that's impacting our uh, bio monitors like fish and then we eat the fish or people swim and then we see all these spikes of new diseases and new, uh, and new uh, issues we end up with. Yeah. Um, you're a professor now at King South University. Yes. And I, I know you think globally and I know, and it was inter- really interesting, the, the fundamentals. What, what you refer to the nobility and the fundamentals? Is that what you refer yes. to? Yes. No, nobility and... Novelty, right? Novelty and fundamentals or no- nobility? Novel- no- novelty. Novelty. Yeah, novelty. Yeah. Yeah. Novelty. Yeah. Yeah. Novelty. Novelty. Yeah. And, and I know you're looking at it the big picture, but now you're, you know, you're in Riyadh at King Saud University. You have a, 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 you know, influential position. How do these things apply to Saudi Arabia? Are there issues in Saudi that, uh, that your your research and your work really, you know, address? Yes. 
Well, now, as uh, you brought a very, very important topic, uh, Richard, uh, if we, if you ask me this question, or anybody else in my position right now, if you ask me this question 10 years ago, I'll, the answer would be definitely different. And now in Saudi Arabia, uh, they uh, focus on innovation. And uh, His Royal Highness uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman just approved a new strategy of uh, innovation, research, and development. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in 2020 and 2040, this will be 2.5% of our GBD. So, uh, and himself, I believe he is one of the innovators we see these days. Uh, he's innovating a lot of uh, aspects in our life. So uh, back to the question about the innovation. I again, and that made me thinking, uh, and believing that uh, tradition and innovation is the Saudi equation. Finally, we see it happening, and uh, we see the global approach. Uh, His Royal Highness, and mentioned uh, before, I think uh, uh, four six months ago that uh, Saudi Arabia will be uh, a role model, a global role model in uh, supporting the environment and globally because these environmental issues, they are not just one country issue. They are not one spot issue. They travel. So when I see the issues traveling and globally, my approach to uh, the innovation is a little bit uh, more advanced than what someone else in my position used to be. So yes, I'm focusing on innovation more. Uh, patents uh, or patents are coming uh, once uh, in every once in a while. And uh, when I create a solution, I make sure like PFAS now is detected and or, uh, and or monitored in the US a lot. Uh, they're creating a monitoring mechanism. It's very, very early stages, but we are creating a solution here in our lab at King Saudi University by developing a new nanomaterial that will be able to help to degrade and detect, degrade, and remove uh, such contaminants. And uh, it goes back to the global humanitarian, humanitarian approach that scientists here usually like to approach. Um, let me do a little commercial for for the nine six six and Saudi US Trade Group. Go ahead. We did a we did a segment in a couple episodes ago on the newly established research development and innovation innovation agency that's going to be at Capsarc, and uh, you know, and, and we talked about exactly what you know the Crown Prince you referenced. The Crown Prince is trying to uh, uh, roll this up under one agency where so so they're paying attention to, to these research development innovation across all the ministries and that you know people aren't uh, duplicating efforts and that sort of thing the other thing yeah. and this is now a shout out to our our Sustig review which we do at, which we do every day we had an interesting article today on oxagon and okay. it talked about it talked about it's what it will focus on and it, it had seven sectors one of them was water innovation not just water, water innovation. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's a term you've just used. Yes. It's, it, it's just interesting how everything, you know, there seems to be a, a general understanding and a, and, a, and a mobilization across all sectors and all ministries and all agencies to, yes. to, to focus on these key, you know, issues. Uh, yes. Uh, water innovation is in hexagon. Water innovation is in new like they're doing uh, humidity harvesting. They're studying so hard, so advanced, and research are coming so fast that to just have uh, uh, some instrument that harvests the humidity in the air and give you, convert it to water. This is in a new They have some machines all around. Uh, I, I get so many emails, especially after the prize, from uh, like uh, high school students who very innovative ideas uh, there uh, you see the new young generation richard it's un unbelievably amazing with the uh, small village in saudi arabia who have a small farm trying to use the bio waste to generate hydrogen 
and from another uh, city in Jeddah or near Jeddah, she's trying to uh, suggest a mechanism to uh, reduce the cost of desalination units in uh, Hexagon. So the global innovative approach led by His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman, is approaching everybody, approaching me at the university, and my, uh, like I feel responsible, challenged. It's approaching the students and the high school, it's approaching the other college students. So, uh, and it's all about innovation. Uh, and again, it goes back to the same equation I told you, tradition and innovation. I have, like Lucian, when he came in, he saw tradition, like and we are modernizing, modernizing. But uh, tradition is still there. We sat and we ate on the floor. Uh, we talked and again, uh, when we step out the door, uh, his vision uh, overcomes our brains about innovation because we have no, we have no excuse no more. Mm -hmm. uh, vision 2030, uh, it lies all what we need to do in in 30 and how we how far we achieved. Uh, he announced uh, Riyadh Green Initiative, which is responsible for increasing the the, tar, the, the green foot green space for each uh, residents of Riyadh and Riyadh's area. Uh, Saudi Green Initiative uh, is uh, reducing the carbon uh, footprint and maybe hopefully in 2060 achieving zero carbon footprint. Uh, it's all the environmental and water approaches. Energy as well, it's a huge uh, what's coming up and responsibility-wise and uh, achieving and achieving-wise at the same time. So what, Aziz, what you're doing and what you've just done is obviously the very beginning of something very new, which is nanotech and water. And I'm curious, so you, you've won this prize, the research um, is completed. Is there a pathway to, you know, you're, you're in pursuit of patents now, is there a pathway to commercializing this product? And um, is that is that realistic in, in the coming years? And that's, is that the plan? Hey, yeah, so uh, when you said about nano, uh, we all know about nanotechnology. We hear about nano. Nano is maybe very small in size, but very big in, uh, uh, small nano is very small in size, very big in action, very big in impact. So there is many, many wide applications of nanotechnology to what I did. So basically, it was I was focusing on the mechanism, what they call a redox mechanism, and I discovered that we published it in High Impact Factor mm -hmm. Journal, and uh, there it's impact factor I think 24, uh, 24 right now applied cases B environment applied catalysis B environment. Environmental applied catalysis B environmental. I have to say the name correctly, and uh, it's been cited a lot. So this mechanism uh, between, uh, for example, iron and zinc in one catalyst uh, can have multiple use. Uh, can be used in energy application. Uh, if we substitute the maybe the zinc, maybe it's possible with cobalt, and then have. Uh, what they call methane uh, reform to generate hydrogen. There are a lot of applications you can start going on. It is closer to fundamental, but when you're closer to fundamental and novelty, uh, you will be able to apply, to uh, provide your science and knowledge to so many other uh, scientists who can then go farther away, step away, uh, one step away, closer to uh, commercialization and commercialize your uh, uh, our commerce commercialize their uh, innovation and based on your uh, patents or based on your discovery. Uh, going back to your question, uh, the redox mechanism on uh, zinc ferrite nanoparticle, uh, it has many other applications. You can coat the material on uh, a membrane. Uh, you can uh, modify some uh, water treatment plants and apply the technology. Uh, it is uh, possible commercialization, but maybe one step or two steps farther down the line. And when you heard about your team winning this prize, describe to me your feeling, your reaction, what it went through your think mind? Came. Uh, I was in the U.S. and it was 2 a.m., I guess. And, it didn't, it <laughs> and didn't you were still think. awake, okay. <laughs> if I, had, yeah, I was sleeping. 
But uh, you, if in 2012 or 2013, uh, I was reading and I knew about Prince Sultan International Prize of Water. I had in my mind since then. Uh, I emailed Dr. Mm-hmm. Dion. I was like, Dr. Dion, uh, I think we should apply by because he's my advisor and I still, uh, I think, him as an advisor. Dr. Dion, I think we should apply for this prize. And he's like, it's too early. He saw the motivation, but he knew how big it is. He knew how big it is. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he saw the motivation, and they still kept working so hard. And that goes back to passion. You know, uh, I would stay until 2 a.m. in the lab. Uh, you know, when you start to experiment, you cannot just stop and go. You have to monitor the experiment. You synthesize your material. And what made it more challenging uh, for me that uh, most of the scientists in our lab were focusing on photocatalysis. Uh, some catalysis uses a source of light to be activated and then excitation and then works as a catalyst in your reaction to remove emerging contaminants or to other target other reactions. Uh, I was focusing on the energy aspect. So I said UV consume a lot of electricity. Okay, electricity is, uh, it's not clean electricity yet in many places in the world. It's not a source of solar panel. It's not a source of uh, wind. It's just electricity. So I said, if I'm working on an environmental aspect, my catalyst, my material has to work alone. Uh, so I focus on this redox mechanism that the new catalyst work on dark. They call it dark reaction right now. So you don't have to provide light, you don't have to provide anything, very reliable, and it's reusable. So you can use a magnet, it's a magnetic nanoparticle that works on the redox mechanism. You collect your magnet, use your magnet, and collect the magnetic nanoparticle from your reaction medium again. So uh, it was maybe seven years of hard working, Hmm. Uh, frustrating. Uh, uh, many people are saying you're going the right direction. But again, uh, going back to the books, fundamentals was very helpful for me to uh, achieve. And when I heard the prize, everything flashed back in my brain since 2012, 2013. It's it's interesting you mentioned, you know, you referenced these young kids who are really excited and, and, and have new ideas. You referenced the crown prince's basically call to the, you know, people, you know, we, we have this challenge. This is a roadmap. What you said, you know, we have no excuses. We have to go do it now. One of the big aspects that the crown prince envisioned 2030 is trying to promote is more local R and D more re- local research and development. So you're coming from the university in Cincinnati, which, which has a good reputation clearly with Dr. Dion and that, that, that department. And is a, you know, highly intensive research and gave you all the tools you needed. Uh, can you do the same in Saudi Arabia? Are you going to try and do this in Saudi Arabia? What are your resources in Saudi Arabia in terms of research and development? Very, very, very good question. Uh, we had a lot of resources at Cincinnati. And when I came, I had this in my mind. So when we talk about resources, we focus on two resources in, uh, in our in research and development field, especially when we're closer to the academia or university level. Uh, an instrumentation, availability of instrumentation, and manpower. And now you directed me to my other point that I love talking about, uh, Richard. I'm very happy. So an instrumentation, uh, Kings of the University. And when, King, when uh, we talk about Kings of, the, uh, Kings of the University, we talk about a lot of aspects. It's history, Saudi Arabia. It's one of the oldest university. Okay. Location in Riyadh, His Royal Highness said something very, uh, very uh, big for us. He said Kingston University will be one of the top universities, ten top university in the world. He said, in, in, I think last year. And then everybody is like on his feet and start working because uh, he is a man say a man do like uh, that's what we see a lot. Uh, everything he said so far, we see results on in our uh, own eyes on the streets, on offices. We see that. So he said, 
he said King Saud University will be one of the top 10 universities or will be. Uh, there is no doubt about it. Back to the research, uh, we need instrumentation. So we have a lot, we already have so many uh, instruments in our labs. Uh, in King of in, in King Saud University, uh, College of Engineering, College of Science, uh, we have a nano center. Uh, so it's equipped with all the instrumentations we need. The previous challenges uh, back then who, uh, we had here is the uh, human capital resources. Mm -hmm. uh, after the King's uh, scholarship program, uh, they came to the US, they studied, and that shows the, how deep collaboration between the two countries on the scientific side. Uh, very, very deep uh, educating. And these young when they, young fellows, some of them came with bachelors, masters. Some of them saw their family members came with a higher degree. So they started going to master's level. And we have more master's students right now at university, uh, Kingston University, KSU. Uh, more motivation. Uh, I teach nanomaterial. Uh, nanomaterial synthesis, it's a course in uh, graduate level. And uh, these are two topics at the same time. And they have nine uh, students. They are ladies. Uh, they are uh, very, very, very smart. Everybody has very innovative idea to talk about and to synthesize and to produce to uh, the innovative world. I teach. Uh, the class is one hour and, and 10 minutes. Sometimes they keep going an hour and a half. And every other girl has a question. They are passionate. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, uh, I have a question, and when I answer the question, she's like, okay, doctor, I'm wondering why. Then you keep talking, and the class keep going. This goes to passion. They're passionate about what they're doing, and His Royal Highness uh, unleashed their power. So uh, the woman capital, uh, human capital in Saudi Arabia, now they're bigger, they're stronger. So now we have human resources, uh, lab resources. Uh, funding is coming soon to the research after the announcement of the of the strategy. So yes, I can. And actually, I'm more challenged than I used to be before in this position. So uh, I'm excited for the future. I'm excited for the results yet to come. I know. Uh, uh, before I want to, we want to get both Lucian and I want to get to your experience on the uh, the scholarship program because okay. this is of course when we first met you. But a little factoid because I feel a little ownership in building King Saud University. When I lived there in the eighties, I worked at King Saud University. Oh, okay. I helped. So uh, I, helped build, I helped build out the library. You know all the books and that okay. sort of thing because oh, I was working there God. at the U.S. Embassy. So anyway, and this was not you know shortly after it was built. So it's an amazing campus. It's a beautiful campus. It was it huge the, too. Yeah, it and, still um, looks the same and very like uh, like it's it looks new. It's very authentic. You walk in, you feel the good vibe. Yeah. Uh, so it means a lot to me to be part of KSU, to be honest with you. So, uh, so you were just a kid when we first met you. Yeah. You were on scholarship. And tell us how you tell us how you got into it. At that time, it was King Abdullah scholarship. It's been renamed and it's refined a little. But I mean, you were, you know, it started in two thousand five. I mean, you were really right at the heart of when it was really especially active. What What was your yes. experience? So I'm, my experience, uh, I started actually a little bit 2004 when I came to the U.S. Uh, before the, we heard about scholarships, there was another line of scholarship where you finish 30 credit hour and then you can join uh, the scholarship uh, program, the Saudi scholarship. Uh, I think uh, I used to drive from Ohio back to D.C. just to submit my paperwork. Yes, uh, to Sackham, the right? <laughs> yeah, at Sackham at Watergate. Yeah, uh, me and two of my friends we opened the map. We went uh, to Triple A, take the maps, and then we drive 80s, uh, 80 east until we get to DC. Then we change a little bit. So, from that time until now, you submit your application online and just to have your Zoom interview with your advisor, academic advisor. I see my younger brother do it. It's quite like a uh, transformation for the effort they did at uh, SACIM and at the Ministry of Higher Education, or used to be Higher Education. So I, I, I look at myself when I started my uh, bachelor. Uh, 
uh, one of the one of the challenges at the very very beginning uh, was how to uh, situate yourself and gain as much knowledge as I can when I first walked in. And because I finished English requirements as I was preparing to come to the U.S., I focused on passing my TOEFL exam. So when I come in, because I was self-paid, money is very valuable. I was like, okay, I need to uh, save money and just go straight to the co uh, college classroom. So uh, I was a newcomer. You can tell like uh, Saudi number number of Saudi students were not uh, as high as in 2020 or 2000, actually 12, 13. So I started my chemical engineering uh, courses and the first course that got me very passionate about chemical engineering and environment. Uh, I remember the professor, he's like, who's fault? He's like, look from, look from your window, or we look, and it's fault. He's like, you see that paper falling? It's the same paper you're writing on right now. It was done by a chemical engineer. So you have to know your value and the value of what you do. It was very like, uh, and then we start getting into it. Uh, the embassy gave us a lot of support, uh, knowing that... Uh, Prince uh, Bender Sultan back then that he uh, the mm -hmm. ambassador and uh, his excellency later on uh, 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 his excellency Adil al Jabir uh, the way they they're role models for us so we see them and we try to follow as a young young uh, kids or young uh, students uh, anything we want it's just and not anything, I mean, anything we need, not we want. Uh, we have full support. I remember getting sick one time. There is a phone call, call uh, the SAC, and I was like, uh, I need the hospital. Like, Just go and you're fully covered. That gave us, again, no excuse not to study, not to do your part, not to do what you came to do, like, which is get a degree and learn and then go back and help uh, rebuild. So uh, from that time, uh, it was like three years and a half, four years until I finished my bachelor. Then uh, I started my master's degree and right to PhD. And PhD was a whole new world for me. <laughs> yeah, moving to Cincinnati. And uh, it was challenging in the beginning, especially knowing Cincinnati back then. And then Cincinnati still started developing. Uh, and, the, and the period of nine years I was there. Um, I, I want to speak to that connection with with students, Lucian, and I, I know you can corroborate this. You can, your memory is probably better than mine. So we first met Aziz. So uh, Saudi U.S. Trade Group and, and the Committee for International Trade were part of an ongoing series of uh, business opportunities forums, mm -hmm. and we held them starting in 2010 in Chicago and Atlanta and L.A. And but I can distinctly remember. Uh, his Excellency Adel Jubair Adel Jubair came to the Atlanta one. Now, let me back up. And part of our responsibility was to put together a, a, a Saudi student ambassadors. And part of that process, which was really fascinating, was to reach out, working with SACOM, which is Saudi Arabia, you know, SACOM, mm -hmm. you know, the, well, that manages the students, working with them, identifying the best, most capable students, and really just sort of top performers, and then reaching mm -hmm. out to them to come and be part of this this program and to help out. And of course, that's where we met you, Aziz, and you, you helped on how many of them? Did you help on oh, all three, uh, right? All three? Did you all yeah. three? Chicago, all three. Was, Chicago was the first one, Richard. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, exactly. And then, and then, but I remember in Atlanta, <clears throat> Adel Al Jubair was there. Yes. And the connection, the, 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 the enthusiasm and excitement on the part of the students, Saudi students, Many of them there, you know, as student ambassadors with us, but also many of them just coming to the forum was genuine. It was real. There was a real connection. And it was wonderful to see because it doesn't happen in a, in a huge country. You know, you know, 335 million in the U.S., you don't have that connection. If you're a student abroad and you're ambassadors there, you don't have that connection. You, you know, but in an emerging country where, you know, you have significant you know, community, family, tribal connections. It was it was really strong, very real, very genuine. I mean, the, do you remember, Lucian? I mean, the the excitement was palpable, and it mm -hmm. was it was both ways. Adel Al Jaber was excited to see you guys, 
<laughs> guys were so excited to see him. Do you do I recall that correctly, Lucia? You do, yeah, yeah. So we feel it like when we shake hands, not just like shaking hand and taking a picture with a celebrity, you know, or us. Uh, we hear the words; it means a lot to us. Uh, in 2000, uh, I think 2000, uh, if I'm not mistaken, eight or nine, uh, I went to New York. Uh, his Allah uh, Yarhamah, Prince Sultan uh, bin Abdul Aziz, when he came to New York before he passed away. Uh, he said he was, I think, in my on the age of my grandfather, like a very old man, and he was insisting. I remember this when he, he was walking, he was a little bit uh, tired. Okay, when he saw the students, he cheered, he was so happy. Mm -hmm. Like a guy who's 70, 72 years old, he cheered and he saw, and he said that, Okay, I'm so happy to uh, see you here. And uh, he uh, gave uh, all of us a gift, and it's a new tool. You can go and see it. Uh, I remember what I remember, two things. That he insisted on shaking everybody's hand, each one of us. We are all, maybe like it was a hundred of us, or like 80. And he insisted on shaking every, like we get up to him because he's older, and we say, we shake his hand. He insisted on shaking our hands. Like uh, he would say, and... Uh, I remember uh, our uh, beloved king, uh, King Salman, right now, he was saying that, okay, you, you can relax. And he said, no, I, I have to say salam to every one of them. Until we did all this. So feeling that uh, make us very connected to uh, our royal family. Uh, seeing what they do make us very responsible. Uh, uh, knowing what promise will be delivered, uh, inshallah, uh, make us uh, very excited to keep working harder and harder. It's beautiful, and really. that's from the student. Yeah, it's beautiful. I uh, and again, you know, and I, every time, you know, and, and and happening more and more because you you know international rankings of of universities and that sort of thing. Saudi Arabia is placing more universities and colleges in these rankings at higher levels, but also at international um, uh, contests, you know, scientific, you know, mathematics, Mo whatever. Yes. Every time, you know, a Saudis does well, it's so celebrated. You know, it's in the Arab News, Saudi Gazette, Al Arabiya, Shark al I mean, it's just everywhere. And it's celebrated. I mean, there's really great pride in how, how you know, uh, you know, from their perspective, our kids do abroad. Yes, uh, it's. I I appreciate your perspective. It's and it's real. Uh, you, you see everybody like my WhatsApp. Who, after the prize, people I know, people I don't know, congratulating me and telling me that uh, you made us proud. Uh, when you're in early career and you know it's uh, Prince Sultan International Prize of Water. You see the names applying for the prize. You see people who won it uh, from Berkeley, like very distinguished people from University of Berkeley, uh, University uh, Yale University. So many other very strong universities, and then you place among among them uh, with Dr. Dion. It's very very uh, honorable. Dr. Kirk, I have when talking about our material and the prize, Dr. Kirk in EPA. When I first took home my paper. Before we published it, he's like, this is amazing. And he took the findings and the material actually synthesized to a lab in Chicago, managed by the Department of Energy. And that, again, shows the collaboration, the scientific collaboration uh, between uh, the two countries. And they did extra analysis, and they included the finding in the paper. And he uh, wrote to me, he's like this material will be very important on removing uh, PFAS uh, material, which I suggested to him, but he, is, he, he emphasized that part. And it meant a lot to me from Dr. Kirk, which I have a shout out for him uh, from the 966 show right now. Just so good. Dr. Abdulaziz, thank you so much for joining us on the 966. It has been so good to see you and so cool to see your accomplishment. It was blowing up my LinkedIn feed and I said, Dr. Abdulaziz, no way. That's him. <laughs> we know Nanotech him. Guy. We know him. Yeah. We, we know a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you so much for joining us, sir. It is my pleasure. That was our conversation with Dr. Abdulaziz Al-Nazi. Just such a great guy, great friend, very, very impressive what he's accomplished already in his young career, doing well at King Saud University. Um, thank you so much to him. And again, you can watch all this stuff. If you want to just watch the interview with him or any of these other segments, you can do that on YouTube. Um, but we appreciate his time. Just such good stuff. As we mentioned, we are on Team Aziz. Yes. Team Aziz. Uh, Team Aziz. Uh, Dr. Abdul, uh, Dr. Aziz Amanazi, uh, a, a wonderful guy and doing some fascinating work. What do you think? We doing, uh, we doing Yella? Saudi in a minute. Yella. Saudi in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number one. Uh, Mohammed, Mohammed bin Salman named prime minister. Saudi Arabia's crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman, has been appointed prime minister, a post that is traditionally held by the king. A royal decree announcing his promotion from deputy PM and defense minister cited an exception to the basic law. An official told Reuters news agency the move was in line with the king's previous delegation of duties to him. Quote, the crown prince already supervises the main executive bodies of the state on a daily basis and his new role as prime minister is within that context, unquote. The 37-year-old son of King Salman bin Abdulaziz, 86, is already seen as the de facto head of government for Saudi Arabia. The decree named another of uh, Prince Salman's, King Salman's sons, uh, Prince Khalid bin Salman, as the new defense minister, and a third, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman, remains in the key role of energy minister. Yeah, and uh, Khalid Al Fala remained as Minister of Investment. It was interesting that they they reaffirmed. Typically, when there's a royal shakeup, they announce new people and they announce who they replaced. They've been relieved of their posts, um, but this one was a little different in that it was a reaffirmation of a few key posts. Um, should also note, uh, Richard, <laughs> when we were talking about this and when this was announced, it sort of was like it was to me. It felt like, and this is very simple, but it felt like it was making this like Facebook official, like this went from de facto to de jure, essentially what has actually changed on the ground. I mean, you could say a lot, you can say nothing at all, but this doesn't really change what was actually happening. It just gives it more of a formal title. Of course, uh, there's a lot of buzz about this being this, um, this being a move that was taken to sort of shield crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman from prosecution abroad, give him immunity granted in the U S and elsewhere as heads, as a head of state, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, maybe I, I, I think people can only really guess if that's true, but I mean, this is also sort of shores up the line of succession in, in, uh, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, it just kind of makes it a little bit more official. Yeah, you're right. It has two parts and it does. It's, it is a de facto, uh, you know, there is a de facto, you know, Mohammed bin Salman has been head of, of government, not head of state, you mm -hmm. know, and de facto, uh, does your, I mean, this, this, encoded in law and it's actually there is precedent in the 50s uh uh the crown prince was faisal faisal saud and he was he became prime minister king saud remained king um you know so he ran government operations and 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 so it's it's not it's not highly unusual uh and it does recognize recognize the facts on the ground it's also there's a legal component i, I mean I, I think there clearly is i mean in uh, the, the Jamal Khashoggi, Khashoggi's a widow filed a, a civil suit in Washington D.C. in in October 2020, naming you know the crown uh, crown prince. Um, that judge asked the Biden administration to you know weigh in on whether MBS should be given sovereign immunity. And that concept, the concept of sovereign sovereign immunity, dates all the way back to the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648. And, you know, basically saying heads of state, you know, you, you can't sue or try heads of state in other countries. Um, and they gave, um, you know, they gave the Biden administration had until October 3rd to come back with their, you know, their reading on this. Um, it's clear naming MBS prime minister eliminates that, you know, a prime minister is clearly a head of state and would be considered a head of state. So it's really not a debate anymore. Um, 
the Biden administration at that deadline said, you know, so they got the news that the, the, the change has been made. So the Biden administration asked for another, I think, 45 days. Um, but ultimately, you know, uh, they will come back and say, look, this, this is this you know, Mohammed bin Salman is the head of state and it can't be tried in our courts. Um, so it does, you know, I, I don't think, you know, people were sort of cynically saying that's why, I, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's based in reality. He's the acting head of government. Uh, it's got precedent. Happened in the 1950s. Uh, King Salman's 86 years old. It it uh, it it makes a lot of sense on the ground, and uh, you know if you're if you're looking at it from a legal perspective, it makes a lot of sense legally as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, MBS is my age. That's that always blows me away. He's yeah. way more accomplished than I am, but that's okay. You, you guys, are bro- <laughs> you guys would you guys would be bros when you meet. You'll be bros. We could be bros. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Richard Yellow number two. Saudi Arabia forecasts lower growth and revenue for 2023 amid uncertain global economic outlook. Uncertain global economic outlook is sort of the a very. Uh, Common theme these days, if you read the news, Saudi Arabia, which is forecasting a decade high economic growth of 8% for 2022, is projecting its GDP will slow to 3.1% in 2023. This is according to the Ministry of Finance in a preliminary 2023 budget report released just a few weeks ago, September 30th. Saudi Arabia is also forecasting its total revenue, including oil income, will drop in 2023 in a conservative baseline scenario. The ministry's pre- preliminary estimates are projecting an 8.1% decline in fiscal revenue to $299 billion in 2023 from a year earlier. Quote, this is due to, the, due to the direction that the government is adopting in basing the estimates of oil and non-oil revenues in the budget on conservative standards in anticipation of any developments that may occur in the domestic and global economy, the ministry said. Yeah. So as I mentioned in my one big thing, this was in the running just because I'm a wonk on this stuff. Uh, And I don't really have much to say on it, but it, you know, this is a pre-budget statement in October, the 2022 for 2023. This is important stuff. And this is what I referenced in the one big thing. It's good governance. It telegraphs what the the government's, uh, what's intending to do. It uh, introduces a significant level of transparency. It, uh, um, um, almost all of its estimates, it's, uh, it's conservative in terms of its revenues, it's anticipating, you know, reduced expenditures in 2023, but still running a budget surplus of about $2 billion. By the way, their budget surplus this year is projected to be $24 billion. Mm-hmm. So it's it's showing the level of fiscal responsibility that you want to see, especially in boom times. So, um, uh, you know, all good. And the, 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 again, ultimately an important thing being that this 20, 38 page document that's, that's pretty forthright and, and talks about things is coming out in October for the next year. And it, it, it really helps people make business plans and decisions. And it's a, it, it's a constructive um, addition to the economic environment and how people run their, run their lives and, and do their projections. It's a great point. And Richard, we both talked about this. Um, Capsark just released a study highlighting um, the importance of Vision 2030 when it comes to diversifying the Saudi economy away from oil shocks, um, saying essentially that in what six years, seven years, in twenty in twenty thirty, that Saudi the Saudi economy will be sixty percent less susceptible to oil shocks and oil prices because of what's going on with Vision 2030. It just kind of sort of fits into this because right now, obviously, oil prices are higher. They're also in the news in a big way today and yesterday with OPEC plus cutting uh, production and really just a lot of noise um, coming out on that. And two million barrels, two million barrels. Yeah, Uh, you went there. I went there. I was going to try to try to avoid it. Just you can't you can't I can't look at my phone and not see anything about it. So we'll we'll leave it. But um, just interesting. And this is very it just shows a new responsibility from the Saudi government on fiscal policy. And that, you know, like you said, in boom times, especially important. Yeah. Yella number three, Saudi to host Asian winter games in Neom megacity. Uh, Saudi Arabia was chosen to host the 2029 Asian winter games at Neom, which planners say will feature a year round sports complex. The Saudi bid was quote, unanimously improved unquote. The statement said, noting that Neom will be the first West Asian city to host the event. The Asian winter games are slated to take place in Trojina 
Trojina? How would you how do you pronounce? How would you pronounce? Trojina? I'd say Trojina. Yeah. yeah. An area of Neom, quote, where winter temperatures drop below zero Celsius and year-round temperatures are generally 10 degrees cooler than the rest of the region, unquote. Uh, set to be completed in 2026, Trojina will include year-round skiing, a man-made freshwater lake, chalets, and ultra-luxury hotels. The Asian Winter Games include competitions for skiing, snowboarding, ice hockey, and figure skating, 47 events in all, 28 on snow, and 10 on ice. <laughs> It's really amazing that Saudi Arabia is going to be hosting a winter <laughs> games. I'm sorry. It, it is funny, but it also, it's, it's cool. Um, this is also getting the predictable and usual skepticism and criticism that we see. France came out and blasted this decision. Um, Richard, you know, I'm a big ice hockey player getting a yeah. skate in and neon would be pretty badass. Um, that would be, that would be pretty badass. <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, um, none of the stuff has been built yet. Uh, so that was part of the criticism and, um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just, this is cool. If they have the mountains and they can make man-made snow, I mean, we know that skiers in the Olympics, I learned this watching the winter Olympics last time, they prefer man-made snow. It's a little bit more predictive, uh, predictable and less susceptible to ice. Um, you know, this is, uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, it's, it's amazing. Like the photos, and we're going to have some of the B-roll going, Richard, as we always do. It's my favorite B-roll to add to the post-production because it's so cool. But <laughs> that, yeah, I mean. Trojina awesome. with the lake and everything? Trojina, yeah. yeah. Aspen in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, very cool. I mean, look, the timeline on this. So seven years, they're going to have all this stuff built up there. And it sort of puts a, it puts a firm timeline on it. Oh, instead boy. of saying, well, it's just an open-ended thing. I mean, it's, it's so going to happen now. It lights a fire. It's like, you know, this is like inviting your family for the holidays next year in your new home <laughs> before you've actually built the house. <laughs> and uh, it's a great, that is a great, uh, great. that's a great um, analogy. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's, it's expected to be, Jojina is expected to be finished in 2026. So ostensibly there's a three-year cushion. I think they'll need every bit of that because that's the reality of doing anything of this scale. Mm -hmm. Um you know, Saudi Arabia is going hard at, at these global sort of marquee sh showcase events. And, and, and if you look at something like the G20 or the Formula One, I mean, they throw all their assets into it and it, and, and they, they make it, you know, they make it a success. Um, I think it's interesting. So for example, the Asian Olympic committee, six of the last, uh, Asian winter games, six of the last eight Asian winter games, were held in Japan or China. And apparently there's a little bit of fatigue, you know, they don't want to keep, they don't want to do another one. Uh, and I just think it's interesting where Saudi Arabia sort of is jumping in at these, at these moments of opportunity to do this, what seems completely incongruous, you know, <laughs> the Asian winter games of Saudi Arabia end up, they'll end up making it happen. I'm sure there'll be complaints. You know, there's already complaints about, Oh, you know, if, you, if you're going to, generate all that artificial snow it takes enormous amounts of energy so it won't be uh it won't be you know ecologically sustainable you know it, you know they maybe they'll turn it around and say okay we're going to generate it all with with renewable energy which yeah. would be quite the quite the win and and yet another sort of feather in their cap if they can pull it off but anyway it's 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 you know as we've come to learn and as we know from the current Saudi Arabia it's ambitious as hell and shows a lot of moxie and I, I put odds on my odds are on them pulling it off. Yeah. I mean, the, the criticism shouldn't be leveled against them winning the games. It should be leveled against them just building Trojina in the first place. But to me, that's, it's different than, and it sounds exactly the same as the criticism to level against Qatar with the world cup. You're building all these stadiums and then it's just a one-off event. But in fact, this is not just, they're building all these things for this event. They're building it to be a winter resort. They believe that that's a viable option and could be yeah. profitable for local Saudis who are, you know, dying to go to Switzerland or, or Colorado. They can, if they want to ski and they like skiing or they like winter, you know, vacations, they can go to Trojina. So I don't, I don't think that that criticism is the same, you know, it's a good point. They're building it anyway. Yeah. Let's, let's attract this. Let's, let's, let's put in for this, you know, this marquee event and, and bring attention to it. Yeah. Should be cool. Um, that's it's just it's it is amazing. <laughs> winter winter Olymp or a winter uh, Asian Games destination Saudi Arabia. Um, Richard, 
Yella number four. Saudi Arabia's Savvy Games Group, owned by the country's sovereign wealth fund, the PIF, has unveiled its new investment strategy as the kingdom seeks to become one of the world's major gaming hubs. The world, the group, excuse me, plans to invest $38 billion across four programs, each with specific objectives, according to the SPA. The programs include the acquisition and development of a leading game publisher to become a strategic development partner and making a series of minority stake investments in key companies that support Savvy's game development agenda. They also include diversified investment in investments in industry disruptors to grow early stage games and esports companies, as well as investing in mature industry partners who add value and expertise to Savvy's portfolio. Yeah, that that sort of says it all. I mean, I, I think under this, uh, just to add to that, that you know, under this strategy. They've set aside 13 billion, uh, I think, to buy that major games publisher, you know, up to that. Um, and long term, they want to, you know, establish 250 games companies in the, in the kingdom, create 39,000 jobs and um, raise the sector's gross uh, GDP to uh, 50 billion reals by 2030. I think it's interesting you know they've identified they 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 they've married a real interest locally. There's a significant interest in esports in Saudi Arabia and in games. Um, they've uh, identified it as an investment value, and in a coming technological sector that they want to be part of. And and the Financial Times did an interesting breakdown of of the uh, uh, PIF public investment fund and it ran through its largest uh, holdings in terms of value. Number one was Lucid, which we are big fans of. Number two was Activision Blizzard, which is again in this sector. Number four, Electronic Arts in this sector. Number six, Take-Two Interactive Software. So they're, they're really, really going hard at this sector. It is cool. I. MBS is reportedly a gamer himself, although I doubt that 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 fits into his schedule these days. And another way that we are very similar, I used to love video games. And now it's been about a decade since I've even picked up a controller (laughs) because there's just zero time and I don't need it as a distraction or a temptation. Um, But this is cool. Um, Yeah, very interesting space. Um, If the PIF only wants to invest $12.9 billion and give Richard us that last $0.1 billion, that $100 million, we will take it and, you know, become become more active gamers. Sure. Oh, yeah. No, we'll play (laughs) all the games you want want us to play. Um, Very cool. Richard. Kids and um, family be damned. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Where did daddy go? Yeah, he's a, he's, he's making money. Yeah. Don't bother him. <laughs> that would be Sophie. Don't bother dad. <laughs> um, number five. Five. Yella, number five. The Saudi downtown company, SDC, a company created under the aegis of the royalty, of the royalty and therefore the public investment fund, will promote the launch of projects in various regions of the country, creating new jobs with a view to improving the infrastructure of many cities and building strategic alliances with the private sector. The private, the projects will be developed in 12 cities across the, the, the country. Very cool. Um, this is related to focus on the development of Saudi Arabia's second level cities. So not Riyadh and Jeddah, which are already kind of undergoing a lot of these things. But um, yeah, this is, this is interesting. Um, I don't have a ton to add to this. It's, it's sort of like one of those big announcements from the PIF that in about 18 months, we're going to start seeing a lot more about and a lot of really sort of traction on it. So I guess that companies, this, you know, the company's ambition is to structure more than 10 million square meters, creating modern destinations inspired by local culture and traditional Saudi Arabian architectural motifs, state-of-the-art technology. Uh, the intention is to enhance partnerships and also uh, create business opportunities and investment in commercial retail, tourism, and entertainment housing sectors. Yeah, you're right. We'll see how this plays out. What I do think is interesting and I think is important, and it shows uh, perceptiveness on the, tar- on the part of uh, the government, is that uh, you know, Riyadh's getting a lot of attention, a lot of investment, a lot of growth. You know, it's clearly said this is our leading city. You know, we want attracting. We want to attract foreigners here. We want to attract investment here. We want to attract locals here. 
significant percentage of jobs being created on Riyadh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously it, it can, it can get Riyadh heavy. And, you know, these 12 cities that they mentioned, I did, I looked at it and it's, it, it's interesting. There's uh, three of them are in the West. So if Riyadh's sort of the central part of the country, so West of Riyadh, two of them are South, Najran and Jizan. Uh, five of them are North and two of them are East. So, you know, you got, they really do have a nice geographic dispersion throughout the country. And I think it's a significant uh, investment because people at those, like you say, those second tier cities are going to want to see and want to feel like they're part of this. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, all this, you know, all this excitement and glitz that Riyadh is, they'd like to have a little bit of their own in terms of investment and growth and, and, and development. Yeah, it's a really good point. I mean, if you look down the, the tourism timeline here, I mean, they're trying to get Riyadh to be a big airport and, you know, be a hub. They want, you know, they're building Neom and all these other destinations. And they're like you just said, they're making a lot of investments in Riyadh. People will visit Riyadh, and then when they make their second or third trip, you know, they may want to go somewhere else. These gives this gives those cities sort of a little bit of shine um, mm -hmm. and something to visit. I mean, Richard, we know that these different regions of Saudi Arabia is all not just all one flat desert. I mean, in the south, beautiful mountains, different climate, um, you know, different culture, different things to show off. Um, the east and west, very different. So it's it's sort of like it's an investment on kind of building everything out from where they're starting now, which is really focusing on Riyadh and some of these mega cities. Um, very interesting. Uh, so let stuff. me, let, you know, once again, I'm cross marketing uh, on the our today's uh, Seuss Review, our daily newsletter. The quotable we have a quotable every day. Mm -hmm. Interesting story of a guy, big FIFA fan, big soccer fan. Actually, Venezuela is his team, but he's a Saudi. Um, and he's walking from Jeddah to Doha. So, <laughs> so cool. At 35 kilometers a day. But this is what he said. This is speaking directly to what you're saying. I'm quote, walking from Jeddah to Doha, every 100 kilometers is different. I mean, the first 100 kilometers, there are sand dunes, then mountains, and then comes empty land, then farms. I'm going all, through all, all terrains in one country in two months. This is a beautiful thing. This is what he's saying. Um, all that to say is absolutely there's all sorts of, you know, it's not just all deserts. There's all sorts of different things going on and, you know, geographically in Saudi Arabia. That is so cool that, and it's like the quotable actually covers this as well, but he doesn't walk during the day. So he's like, he wakes up in the morning and he walks until like 10 30 and he's like, it's too hot. I'm going to just wait out the sun, get something to eat. He's eating at gas stations and picking up food just so his and, and, load is and, light. Yeah, and taking showers and stuff in mosques so we can travel light and just sort of, you know, making friends all along the way. Uh, and when he gets there, you know, he's going to, he'll, he'll pull for Saudi. And, but he said, you know, the problem is, I think the Qatar, Qatar, Qatar is playing Venezuela in an early round. So he's, he's got, you know, he says he's a little torn by that one. We have to, we'll give it a few months, give him a chance to go and walk back. Richard, let's try to reach out to this gentleman and have him on the 966 and tell us about his journey. Cause that would be really cool. Um, I'm, I'm, it sounds like a really fun thing to do. Um, Richard number six, yellow number six, Saudi telecom company, the middle East's most profitable, profitable mobile operator plans to spend about a billion dollars to transform the kingdom into a regional data hub and may sell a stake in its Center 3 business to finance the plans. The investment over the next five years by Center 3, as the data unit is known, would help Saudi Arabia make, excuse me, would help Saudi Arabia host more media, gaming, and corporate data. This is according to Mohammed al Abadi, STC's chief carrier and wholesale officer and chairman of Center 3. It would also follow an, an initial investment of $1 billion, wow, on building data centers and submarine data cables. STC is becoming a beast. Huge. Uh, I have a good friend um, who knows this sector inside and out. He says, you know, STC is, is Saudi Cisco and it's, you know, it's just becoming a beast. That STC pay that announced, uh, I have, you know, can't be too long ago. It was worth well over a billion dollars. Um, and I think this is interesting too, because this references that MENA hub that we did a, we did a, a segment on, Last week, two weeks ago, mm -hmm. uh, the two MENA weeks, Hub yeah. initiative. Oh, yeah, when I was talking about uh, Saudi Arabia and Greece and that geostrategic play. 
you know, the, the STC is putting down $850 million or a part of an $850 million uh, effort to uh, set up a subsea cable and digital you know, pathway from Singapore to, to France via Greece. And um, so, again, that, that's sort of building the infrastructure for becoming exactly what this says, you know, wanting to be, you know, sort of the, the, a regional data hub and even beyond that, you know, a much broader regional data hub. STC is really getting it going. Just an impressive company. And they, um, Saudi Arabia is really, I mean, when you, it comes to things like 5G and it comes to digital payments, they seem to be either, you know, right in the, in the thick of things or ahead of the curve. So it's, it's cool to see them start to take now some of this. I mean, they are the most profitable company, uh, telecoms company in the region to actually take some of this money, reinvest and start thinking forward with some of the stuff. They're actually, as the, the blurb mentioned here, uh, thinking about doing a little bit of fundraising for this. So very interesting stuff. Um, Richard, what do you think? Episode 61 in the books. Well Episode done. 61 in the books. Nicely done. That was a lot of good topics, I think. And, and that conversation with Aziz is, is great. Richard, thank you very much. 